Um, so I'm Scott, I'm part of the CMS team that supports people in the centre uh, running models and accessing and analysing data sets. Um, today we're going to be continuing along from where Holger left off last week. Uh, Holger gave a bit of a basic overview of Jupiter. And now I'm going to do some uh, analysis using it, uh, showing some ideas you can use in your own uh, data processing of uh, climate and weather data sets. Um, so we provide the general support to researchers within the centre. Uh, if you need to get in contact with us, uh, for anyone that's new, we have a help desk email. You can email us there and uh, we'll help sort out your problem. And we've also got a Slack channel, so you can log in there if you prefer, prefer a, a text uh, style chat. Um, so today I'm going to be sort of going over a question we got on the help desk. Um, so this is, was a, a good question, so I thought it would be a good example to show everyone how exactly you'd go uh, processing a large data set. Uh, so the target today is to calculate a daily wind magnitude of error 5, um, just over a region here of selected Tasmania. Um, so yeah, ERA 5 is a really big data set, it's a reanalysis at, um, I can't remember the horizontal resolution, we'll see it in a moment, um, but basically to look, it comes with a UNB field, and once we've loaded both of those, that's about 3 terabytes of data that we need to process. So this is a really big data set, and that's just with two surface level fields. Um, We've got most of the surface level data copied at NCI, so you don't have to go over to ECMWF and download it yourself. We've also got some 3D fields over Australia. Um, due to the size of the entire data set, we can't have 3D stuff over everywhere. So, a reminder from where we are were last week. Uh, so we've got a couple of ways that we can start a notebook running at NCI. So we've got in this um, GitHub repository, we've got two scripts. Guardi Jupyter will submit a job to the queue. It costs uh, NCI resources. So if you only if you ask for 48 CPUs and you're running just a Python uh, process. A serial Python process, you're going to be wasting 47 of those, and the center is going to be charged for them. Uh, try and stick to four or fewer for Python style stuff, uh, if you know what you're doing, of course, um, and can measure the performance, you can go higher than that. Um, there's also the VDI, Jupyter.py, will connect to the virtual desktops that NCI has. These are like uh, Linux servers, you can log in and they show you the desktop and you can run MATLAB or Jupyter. Uh, that doesn't cost the center anything to run on them and they can still access the GDAR storage. Uh, but it can get overloaded sometimes. You will share a VDI node with one or two other people. So both of those can access the storage on GDAR. So GDAR is where most of the long-term storage large data sets will be at NCI. Uh, we're not going to store big data sets that we need long-term on Scratch because Scratch gets deleted after 90 days. So GDAR, and there'll be various projects for the different, um, different data sets available. Um, when you run Guardi Jupiter, uh, so the first one of these, it's going to print out some help on how to start up a dust cluster. Uh, we're going to get to that a bit later, um, but it will just sort of automatically open up a web browser. You run both of these on your own computer and they will connect to uh, the relevant service and start everything up for you. Okay. 
So that's sort of the, the recap of starting up the notebooks. Uh, for our analysis, the first thing we're wanting to do is going to be finding that data at NCI. So we know that we're wanting to use the error 5 reanalysis. And we've got information on the CMS wiki. Um, so you can just search for client CMS wiki. It's easier than remembering the link I find. If you go to this, you have uh, the CMS team's wiki where we store lots of information on different data sets, um, models, how to publish your uh, code and data output, uh, various things like that. Uh, but today we're just wanting to access error 5. So we can see we've got some commonly used data sets listed here, or there's a whole bunch of more data sets. All of these will have uh, data stored at NCI, and we can add more things as requested. Oops, not that one, that one. So we'll go into error 5. We want to find service variables. There we go. So it's a quarter degree, that long grid of hourly resolution. So error 5. And we can find data under here. So G data, UB4, error 5. Let's see if you have surface level data. And then it'll be variable year and then the files. Uh, one question. Mm -hmm. Do you have to have access to EV4 project to get this or is it? Uh, you will. Um, all of the you say you do need to join the this project here, UB4. Um, it's easy to do. You go to uh, my.nci.org.au and just request to join the project. It'll always be automatic automatically given to you. Um, there might be a link up here to join the project. No, we don't. But anyway, uh, go to to join a project, nci.org.au. Go up here, it's covered by the screen, by the, uh, by the video there. Um, Yes, Jimbo's linked it in chat. But yeah, the uh, top right corner of the net, NCI website, there's a link to account information. Log in here and there'll be a way to search for projects and join them. So we have our surface level files. If we go into Jupyter, we can take a look at um, those files. So that's just the same path I showed before. Uh, if I process this, this has one year's worth of error five, uh, 10 meter U wind speed variables. Um, is 10 U. Uh, these are all NetCDF format files. Uh, so they contain both the uh, 3D arrays for the data they contain as well as metadata saying uh, what the dates are, what the locations are and that can all be read by different processing tools uh, things like CDO, NCO, uh, NetCDF libraries you'll find for most languages can read these types of files um, but the, if you just open them in a text editor, it's just going to show you garbage. So you do need an NCDF library to be able to work with any of those. Uh, so my favourite tool for working with NetCDF data is X-Ray. Um, so that's what I'm going to be using for this demonstration. Um, so that lets you open up multiple files. So we can open up all of these files for the year, these 12 different monthly files, and combine them into one virtual file so we don't have to swap between files and have loops and so forth. Um, but yeah, to open a file with X-Ray, there's two versions. There's a single file version, which you just give a single path. So this is just the path to one of those 
net CDF files. If we go on to the end, it shows the .nc. If we run that, we'll think for a little bit as it uh, wakes up the storage. And then here you're seeing some of the metadata that's within that net CDF file. You can see it's got variables, latitude, longitude, time. Uh, it's got some attributes. These are like text uh, metadata. Um, thanks, Jimbo. Jimbo's just put a link in chat. Um, if you've if you've got the thing on your desktop, you can join you before. Okay, so we've got our data set with our variables and so forth. It's got U10. So get your 10 meter wind speed. Uh, we can look at that pretty easily. DS.U10 will get you an individual variable. So here we've got the variable U10. You can either use it with a dot or you can use it with array uh, style access. Both work, both produce the same thing. And it's also got some more metadata on this variable, what it actually is, 10 meter U wind, units, meters per second. Uh, always handy to have units with your numbers. Yeah. Um, so that's opening a single file. We can do the same with all of the files. So here I've switched instead of open MF data set. So here I have just open, open data set as a single file. MF means multiple file, so it's going to open up multiple files. I've just given it a star here, so in the file name this was the date. So we had in our list of files, each file is ending with a date. Um, if your files are dated in ISO format, so that means it's got the year, the month, the day, um, then they're automatically in order. So here we can see that it's going one, two, three on the months. So these are ordered in the correct order. Uh, so we don't have to do anything special. We can just combine nested. Nested means combine them in the order their file names are. Um, there's another way to do it, which will actually open up the file and check the time values if you don't have uh, like regularly named files. But here we're just going to add them one on top of one next to the other. And if we run that, we can see our time axis. Here it was 744 time steps. Now it's 8,760. So it looks exactly the same. So it looks exactly the same as when we open a single, single file, only the time axis is much bigger. So it's abstracting away the fact that we've got 12 different files, one for each month. We only need to worry about our one time series. Um, we can see as well here in the time limits, we're stepping from January 1st uh, to December 31st. And again, accessing a variable works exactly the same. Um, so we can see then uh, the contents of a single variable. Are there other ways of combining it? So you know how it says nested there? Yes, uh, so there's nested and then there's by cohorts. So what that's going to do is open up each file, look at what the first and last time, time steps in that file are, yeah. and then sort them using those first and last time set steps. Okay. So if you had um, files where the names don't sort in order, so here we've got a well-structured data set with ISO time steps, yeah. stamps. Um, if you had um, like O instead of year, month, day, day, month, year, mm -hmm. um, so then it'll be January 2019, January 2020, yeah. February 2019, February 20. This um, this sorts that. Okay, cool. Uh, I recommend using ISO 
timestamps wherever you can. Uh, makes things a lot easier. You don't have to concatenate on time, you can concatenate on latitude or longitude. If you've got model output that's been split up into uh, grid segments, you can use this to uh, bring all of those together into a single horizontal slice as well. So you don't have to say time, you could use latitude or longitude. Okay. So we've got our data set. We've got one year of one field. Yes. yes. Um, can the concatenated dimension be a new dimension that you want to create? Like, for example, if I didn't have time in my data, but I wanted to kind of concatenate it in time with the files being different time sets? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we can combine this uh, sample. And that's going to add a new dimension sample. Um, our time axis has gone back to a single uh, month time. Um, what has that? What has that done? Oh, that might that might automatically be spacing out. So we've still got the full years of data. So it's extended each sample's time axis to cover the whole thing, but it's. Hard to explain. Um, but yeah, we've got a new dimension sample there, and we could access a specific sample or whatever you want to call your new thing. Um, so, if if these didn't have a time axis in them, this is what you do. Um, just put time there. Uh, you'll see that it had, says dimensions without coordinate sample here, because that was my uh, virtual dimension I've added in here. Uh, it's not going to automatically work out what the time values for each time step are if you don't have that time axis. Uh, so you'll have to add that in separately yourself later on. But yes, you, you can add a dimension that's not present in your data set. And it will just put the files in order in that dimension. Okay, uh, so uh, the variables within a data set work just like a NumPy array. So most things you can do on a NumPy array, uh, you can do here. N bytes shows you the number of bytes within an array, so it shows you how big it is. And we can see with this amount of data, it's about 34 gigabytes of data. Um, in this data set that we've just loaded. So I'm running this on Guardi with four CPUs and 16 gigabytes of memory. Um, so this is bigger than the memory we have available. Um, but we're still able to load it with no problem, even though it's bigger than our memory. It's also bigger than the memory if we were running it on VDI, it would work the same. What happens here is data within the netcdf file is only actually read when you try and do something with it. So if you load a specific value, um, so if I, for instance, wanted to plot a specific coordinate, what this is going to do is it's only going to read in data for that one location, that one latitude and longitude. Uh, this is just how you select within a X-ray object a specific coordinate. So it's gone through that three gig, that thirty gigabytes of data on the file system, and it's just loaded what we need to plot the data. So we've not run out of memory, even though it's bigger than the memory we have available, which is nice. Uh, you can actually try and load the whole thing. Uh, that is going to probably give us an out of memory error. But to load a whole array, we can do dot load. And we'll see what that comes up with. But yeah, most of the time you don't want to manually load everything because that will fill up all of your memory. 
you want to keep everything in the lazy world where it's only red when you're actually going to use it. In what circumstances would you ever load a whole type set, like if it was quite small? If it's quite small, yeah. Um, so it's going to be generally faster for a small data set to keep it in memory. Okay. Um, but you don't normally have to do this. It'll automatically be loaded as you use it. Mm. Here we go. We've died because we've run out of memory. So that's what happens if you try and load 30 gigabytes when you have just 16. So I'm just going to rerun everything again. Get up to that point. So NetCDF files themselves are lazily loaded. This happens in any language you try and use. Um, if we were trying to run with Fortran, for example, it would work exactly the same. Um, X-Ray has an additional layer on top of that per file uh, laziness using a library called Dask. Uh, Dask allows you to like, break up a large array into a number of smaller chunks and work just on that chunk. Uh, so it's helpful for uh, both keeping memory under control as well as parallelization. So it allows you to run an analysis in parallel. So we can look at the data within our variable with this dot data thing. And we can see that it's showing us that the full array, so this many time points, this many of that, this many long, and it's been broken up into a number of subarrays, one for each file in this case. Uh, so we can see we've got 12 chunks, each about 3 gigabytes, and the whole thing is about 36 gigabytes. Uh, for the most part, this is just behind the scenes part. See, behind the scenes stuff. Um, this all works exactly the same as a NumPy array. You can access it uh, using normal NumPy type, type uh, indexing, for instance. Um, but rather than storing the values directly, they store how to get that data. So if I, so here, getting out of um, X-Ray, if I try just manually making a Dask array, uh, just an array of all zeros, 10 by 10, and I'm saying it should be broken up into 5 by 5 chunks. So it looks like this, a 2D array with four chunks each 5 by 5. What Dask is doing is it's storing how to calculate each of these subarrays. Uh, so if we look at that, we visualize it, it's saying that the chunk 00, zero is calculated using the zeros function. And chunk 01, so this, this chunk here, is also calculated by the zeros function and so forth. Um, so it's storing um, how to get each part of the data um, for something as simple like this, as this, it doesn't matter much. But when you're getting into larger data sets, it allows the computer to only work on one to only work on one chunk at a time. So only work on one month at a time of our data. And it builds up this graph as you add operations. So here I've got two arrays the same shape as previously, adding them together. It says it's still going to give the same, same type of array, a 2D array chunked two by two. But if we visualize that, if we show the graph, now it's showing to calculate chunk zero, zero, so to calculate the data in here, 
what it needs to do is add chunk zero zero of the A array and the B array. So it's building up this graph of operations. Um, so as it builds up this graph, it doesn't actually run any calculations. Um, it's just building up how to do it. Um, so we can set up a big calculation on a really big data set and it's only going to get run when we tell it to uh, do the processing, either by trying to plot it, trying to save it, or trying to manually load it. Uh, Dask is smart enough to only do the calculation for the parts of the array it needs. So if you're only trying to uh, show a single time step, it will only do the calculations required to generate that one time step. So here it's only proceeding to get this one part of the graph. Um, and uh, to convert it back to a NumPy array, if you're working with a small data set, um, you can run the compute function to manually uh, run this process. Uh, graphs can get more complex uh, if we try and multiply the two arrays. Like I said, they just work like NumPy arrays. So we just call NumPy matrix multiply. And then we're getting a much more complex graph. Uh, so there's lots more bits and pieces involved because you've got the uh, cross between the, the two segments. Uh, so Graphs can become really complex uh, when you're processing a large data set. There's a trade-off between the size of each chunk, so how much it's going to take in memory, and how complex the graph is going to be. Uh, if we had, if we had smaller chunks here, so if we did two by two chunks, so we've got 25 total chunks, uh, the graph is going to become much more complex. There's lots more moving pieces for the computer to, to keep track of. Um, so that's a bit of behind the scenes stuff. Um, we can implement that in X-Ray then um, by adding a chunks parameter uh, here. So chunks, chunk it in latitude and long, longitude and latitude with this chunks parameter here in the open MF data set. And that lets us break up our big data set into lots of smaller chunks. So here each chunk is about 100 megabytes Whereas previously, if we didn't have that chunking, if we go up here, it's about three gigabytes. So the reason we use this chunking is to be able to work on smaller bits of data um, at a time. So if we tried to load in a full, a full chunk, a, a full month of data here, a full three gigabytes, we're not going to be able to do too much of that in our memory. So we've only got 16 gigabytes of memory. So with uh, chunks being three gigabytes, if we try to multiply them and get a mean or something, that adds up. So we get three plus three plus three, and you get to 16 pretty quickly. Whereas if you have smaller, smaller chunks, if we break up our big array into smaller pieces, uh, we're able to do more with them. Okay, so all of that was just to get to this point, which is where we're calculating the wind. Um, after all of that, it's pretty simple. We've got our 10 meter U wind field. We've got our 10 meter V wind field. We're just calculating vector magnitude here. So u squared plus v squared, square rooted. 
and that was what 60 gigabytes of memory so we had 36 gigabytes in U, 36 gigabytes in V and we've got our wind field pretty quickly of course it's not actually formed any calculations yet um, but we can work with the work with the variables really simply I mean, the, so there's nothing complex happening here there's a lot of complex stuff happening behind the scenes but for the most part we don't need to worry about it um, so beyond that the era 5 data is going to be hourly so if we look at the time field of our wind we can see there's uh, T0, T100, T100 and so forth. Uh, we want daily data. Um, X-ray provides a number of functions for uh, modifying the time series so we can resample to daily data easily enough. doing a resample time equals day dot mean so it gets the mean of each day's value um, but the downside of using the wind daily thing if you've got a large data set so if you were for instance analyzing all of era 5 um, is that it makes a lot of chunks so it makes one chunk for each day uh, we can see that we've got uh, 11,000 chunks here if we look at the number of chunks here uh, whereas we started with 384 um, so when you've got lots of chunks so if we were doing this on the entire era 5 um, data set this becomes really slow to process um, so you end up waiting a lot of time while it works out that graph of things it needs to do. There's so much, so many bits and pieces. Uh, so within CMS we've got a library called ClimTAS which uh, can help with that if you find that using X-rays uh, native resampling uh, either runs out of memory or it takes a really long time to run um, we've got a blocked version of what we call blocked resample um, works the same as x-rays resample with a couple conditions um, x-ray will uh, work out which time values are within a day so if you have irregularly sampled data that would all be fine. This one just groups them into 24 steps um, and does resampling in blocks of 24. So it's not as good for like observational data sets, uh, but for really large data sets, uh, this can be helpful. So it's only got 384 chunks, so it's a lot simpler for the computer to, to keep a handle on. There's a lot, lot simpler graph that DAST is keeping track of. And this graph complexity really, really is important with really big data sets. Um, yeah, we've got a web page there which shows some of the functions that this Clean Chaz thing has. Okay. Um, so, before we've basically done all computation, it's not taken too much. The benefit of all this X ray stuff is that for the user, it's all, all pretty straightforward. Um, before trying to save your big analysis to disk, um, which is the next thing I'm going to do, um, it is important you check how big it's going to be. Um, here the output data set with just one year of daily mean wind fields is just 1.5 gigs, which is fine. Um, if you're using hundreds of gigabytes, 
Um, we encourage you to get in touch with us to see if there's a better way to more effectively use our storage. Um, but for sure, under 100 gig gigabytes is fine um, for your processed data sets. And disk quota is shared between all members of the pro project on NCI. Um, so if you fill up your group's project, no one else in the group is able to run uh, jobs on Guardi. So we do encourage you to be considerate with what you use. Um, so we've checked that it's going to be a reasonable size. Let's check that the values are reasonable. So here we are selecting around Tasmania. They're going to do, like we did previously, that that plot is only going to request the data that it needs. Turn off the coastlines. So here we've got a vague, blurry outline of Tasmania. Uh, wind speeds up to 14 meters per second, which seems reasonable. Um, so yeah, check to see that the numbers are reasonable before you spend a couple of hours processing things. And we can save it to get CDF. Make that a bit simpler first. So we can grab our data over Tasmania. And we can save it to NetCDF just by calling the to NetCDF function uh, sample.nc. Tasmania.nc. So when we, when we save it to NetCDF, it's going to go in and do the actual processing. So it's going to load all those different bits in the graph and do, do the calculations required. So while previously it's not taken much time at all to do any calculations, um, now it is actually going to do work, which is going to take time. Um, yeah, going back to this task output, um, it's useful to keep an eye on this as you're, you're running through your notebook. So as we've done here, going step by step, make sure the chunk size is reasonable, so make sure it's, say, under a gigabyte. Make sure the number of chunks doesn't like, dramatically increase at any stage. It's generally that means something's gone wrong. Same for the number of tasks. Tasks is basically items in that graph. So here, if we go back up, here we've got some number of tasks. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-ish. Um, so not quite. I was with a previous... Oops. Yeah, 12 tasks. So tasks is the number of items in that graph. Make sure it doesn't jump up too dramatically, like by orders of magnitude. Uh, same with number of chunks. And since that ran, it looks like our file is saved. So if I make a new thing, ls tas sample.nc, you can see our output file is here. Uh, there's a bunch of files for working with NetCDF data and sort of visualising and checking what's in them. NC dump is useful. That prints out the metadata that's contained within that file. So here we've got longitude, latitude, time, resample of 8CAAC, lots of nonsense. Um, so we've got some, some good stuff here, but we do want to improve what's output by default just with .2NetCDF. Um, so we can give it a name. 
So if we give our, vari our variable a name, that name is going to be put here instead of some random nonsense. So we want to call this wind. We might want to give it units. So wind speed in metres per second. And we might want to turn on compression. Um, compression is always useful. That means we use less space on disk, so bigger data sets will fit on disk uh, for something like this, uh, where we're just using like a couple of gigabytes. Uh, it's not as important, but as you're going up into the hundreds of gigabytes, definitely you want to be uh, looking at compression. Uh, we set that up with this encoding dictionary where we say for each variable, so here for the wind variable, we want to turn on compression, uh, turn on shuffle filter, um, which is basically improves compression, I guess you could say, and say we want a moderate amount of compression. Uh, so this comp level is a number between 0 and 9. 0 means no compression, you're not saving any disk space. Uh, 9 means lots of compression, it's going to take a long time to process. Um, 4 is a good balance in between those. And then we can save that uh, to NetCDF, so I'll save that as file I was using previously, which was tessample.nc. Uh, so this is just what I've, I had up above, just spaced out a bit. So our variable, selecting over Tasmania, converting to NetCDF, using that um, encoding uh, stuff. And you can get a fancy little progress bar if you add this with dask.diagnostics.progress bar, which will show you as it's being processed. So it took 12 seconds, which is pretty good. And if we now look at the output of that file, we can see we've actually got a name for our variable, and we've got units, uh, which is handy to have. So how are we going with time? So that's just going to use less space on wherever you save it. Yeah. But if you open it up, it's... It's exactly the same data, loses nothing. Okay. What what would you lose if you put a higher compression or it just takes longer to save? It, it takes longer to save, basically. Okay. And the higher you go, the less you gain. Okay. So it's like a logarithmic uh, thing. Okay. So in the middle is a generally a good, good spot to go. Uh, we can check how much it compressed. Let's do ls-lh to see the size of that file. You can see this is 409 kilobytes, so half a megabyte. And if we did the previous saving, sorry, can I just add one thing? Um, mm -hmm. So up to five or six level of compression is usually fine. You you're not really impacting on your a lot on your writing and reading, and more than six is start to slow down. Okay, thanks, Bell. So, so here, right. so the first method without compression is about five hundred and twenty kilobytes. Mm -hmm. The second method is four hundred. Obviously, this is a pretty small file, so it's not that important. If we were, instead of just selecting the grid points over Tasmania, if we were getting the whole horizontal domain, which was uh, one gigabyte, then a 10% savings in space does start to become more important. Okay, so that was some fun with about 60 gigabytes of memory. Uh, what if we wanted to do all of era 5, which is 40 years of, da of hourly data at quarter degree resolution? The good thing about X-ray and dust is that nothing really changes. 
So I'm just going to do exactly the same as what I did previously, only instead of just loading the 2019 values, I've put a star here, so it's going to load all of the years that are available. Um, it's, it is obviously going to take a bit more time to load everything. Uh, so we won't be sitting here a while as it goes and opens up each file and reads their metadata. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's just the same. Give it a moment here to uh, process. Uh, while we're waiting, was there any questions anyone had? Um, how do you decide on how many chunks should be in your data array? Um, you're, you're aiming more on the memory size of it, so I guess around 100 megabytes would be a good starting point. And also those that dot data and dot visualize mm -hmm. the IQ arrays, is that built into um, XRA or is that on Dask or is that something you've created? No, that's built into Dask. Cool, so yeah. That, you can all use all of this in your own notebooks. Um, if you've got a lot of chunks, that visualization function isn't too useful. It's mostly useful when you're just starting out, uh, just load a small amount of data. Just because the graph gets so complex, it becomes impossible to read. Okay, so that didn't take too long. We've loaded 1.5 terabytes of data with quite a long time axis. Um, you can see we've increased a lot in the number of chunks, obviously, just because we're loading 40 times more data or whatever it is. But all of our processing is sort of just the same. It takes sort of no time to run it all, just while you're preparing it, obviously saving it when it does need to run the calculations takes longer. Uh, but we can see that running our uh, calculating the wind and working out the daily mean uh, using the blocked version, of course. If we just use normal X-ray resampling here, you're going to run into problems. Um, but we can see we've only got like 60 gigabytes of data. So this would be fine to save to disk if you wanted to save the whole of ERA 5. Um, if you know other people are going to be using it, uh, talk to them, talk to us, and we'll get it installed centrally so not everyone is using 60 gigabytes of data. Um, yeah, all good. This is a, a, like a reasonable sized data set. Uh, don't try and save like, hourly data, that, that would be nonsense. Um, as you go into big data sets, um, the way Dask works is it can start loading too much at once, too many um, bits at the same time. Uh, we've got a saving function as well, which we call to NetCGF throttle. This just makes sure not too much gets run at once. You don't run out of memory. Uh, yeah, we can save that to uh, file. to stop that. How much time do we have? Well, we've got 10 minutes. We can, we can start looking at parallel stuff. Turn that off. Oh, yes. So that would take a decent amount of time to run. It's not going to create too big a file though. Um, just, so to speed some of this up, we can try running in parallel. So one of the other advantages of of Dask breaking up the arrays into lots of little bits is the calculations on each of those little bits can all be done in parallel. Um, so we can get a, a, a little bit of parallelization out of things. Uh, there are limits to how parallel a data analysis like this can be. Uh, writing out a NetCDF file is a serial operation. It cannot be done in parallel, so you're going to be limited by the output speed of saving your data to file. Uh, you can generally read as many files as you want. 
uh, that writing to a file will, will limit your speed. So I've used uh, Guardian Jupyter to start up a, a notebook running on Guardian. I've got four CPUs loaded. Um, so what I can do is start this thing called a Dask client, which allows us to run Dask operations in parallel. When you run uh, Guardian Jupyter, it prints out this information which says how to start up this Dask client. Um, so we can go here, uh, if I can select it all, go to copy that, let's make a new one and paste it in. So I'm telling it to have N workers be the number of CPUs available in the queue job. Setting a memory limit for each worker is about four gigabytes, since that's the amount of memory a Guardi node has per CPU. And I'm set telling it to save any temporary garbage that it makes. This can create a lot of temporary garbage, so you want to set this to not be your home directory. Um, I've set that to the JobFS directory. Uh, JobFS on Guardi is a SSD disk that's directly on the um, node, on the compute node. So this isn't going to use any allocation. This is just for temporary storage. And we can see that it's created a cluster of four workers with four cores and about 16 gigabytes of memory. You can go to this handy link and it'll bring up some uh, dashboard information saying it's not storing much data, there's nothing processing. Uh, if we start something processing, so if we start, actually restart the kernel, just run everything cleanly in, in this parallel mode. running again this to, to set up the uh, Dask cluster. We can load up the dashboard. So now we're going to run in parallel with four processors. Nothing's changed in the analysis, um, apart from me just saving a file per year. So here I've grouped them in by year. Um, I'm saving the whole horizontal domain here. But all of the calculations I've still got, just wind is the square root of u squared plus v squared, and then a daily mean. Um, so this is going to take a bit of time again to read in the data. But we should, in a little bit, start seeing jobs processing in parallel here. Here we go. So here we've got our four workers, each busily running away, running along, loading um, bits of one particular file or another and calculating the wind magnitude. Um, and this will happily churn along for a while, producing your output. Um, so yeah, that's going to provide a bit of speed up for uh, reading in the full time series. Uh, you're not going to get much benefit from going to like a full node's worth of CPUs. Uh, if you are doing a lot of this, it's best to measure to work out uh, what the most efficient number of processes is going to be to run this in parallel. Um, full is probably a good starting point. Um, but yeah. Play around, see what see what happens. Um, it does let you know how much memory each process is using, uh, which can be handy to keep an eye on. You don't want this obviously going up to the top. Um, if it does, you might want to use smaller chunks, for instance. Um, so there, that's going to happily 
now churn away for a while and producing an analysis on the full three terabytes of, of data from the U field and V field in error five. So hopefully some of that's useful to you. As you can see, basic data processing, I've not done anything fancy here, but it all fits within one page. Um, so it's, it's fairly easy to do. Some things can trip you up. Um, so things like that resampling, if you use Expo's default, uh, can perform pretty terribly. Um, as a bonus, just before we finish, there's also a blocked group by. If you're doing things like climatologies, uh, this will this should also be a bit bit of an improvement as opposed to the default X-rays group by. Um, if you're familiar with that, um, so that's available. Uh, this is all in the unstable conda environment. So at NCI, we maintain generally two conda environments: a stable analysis-free environment and an just a minute and an analysis-free unstable. Uh, so all of the new stuff goes in the most recent version. Okay. Uh, so that was it from me. Were there any questions as we let this process away? Can I just start one thing while people are thinking of questions? Um, if, since we use ERA 5, like Scott said, if you need to do something like that, say with one hour resolution, just let us know because I'm actually looking at providing extra products. Or in some cases, for example, the person who requested this, there was a product that doesn't cover 2019, which was unfortunate, uh, but that actually already provides this already calculated and it will take us no time to download it and make it available. So there, there might be something there which is a value others and we're happy to to either download or calculate for you, especially if it, you know, it's going to occupy a lot of storage. I have a question, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to upload this new script onto GitHub as well? Uh, yes. Uh, so we'll be sending around a link with the recording. Um, and the notebook, so you can take a look at that and, and uh, try it out for yourself. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think I yep. yep. Uh, sorry, sorry, oh, Scott. None of this will go out. Okay. Yeah. It's time to free up the room. So, if there are any more questions, please do. Uh, let us know either by the help desk or Slack channel. We're always um, happy to help. Um, so these are the links. And we'll leave it there. Thank you.